Genocide requires intent and actions. Right, but but so right. If, and if we Israel's can... intent is to if Israel's intent is to commit genocide against the Palestinian people in Gaza, they're the worst nation in the history of war at implementing their intentions. Their actions are doing everything in opposite of killing. In, in the Russia and Ukraine thing, I can, I, I can evaluate just wars and why did you start the war? That, you know, I, I focus on the war okay. and the execution of the war. And then there's just application of the war. So the, what are your actions in the war? So intent right. has to be combined with actions. I don't think it has to. Said, I think it can be and we can get to intent. Does. But I think it just has to start with action. And we have to look at just the facts on the ground that 1.5% of the Palestinian population at least has been killed. Now, you could say, well, I don't trust Hamas's numbers. And maybe that is. So then what did the Israelis say? How many people have been killed according to the Israelis? Well, one. Oh, so let's do the numbers then. So 38,000 is what the currently the Gaza Health Ministry, which is a Hamas run organization. Those, those aren't that isn't biased. That's a fact. Sure. I mean, Hamas and the is IDF is it. Netanyahu run. I mean, you know, but either way, it's, what are their numbers? It's Israel run, right? Okay. It's Israel run. Um, so if we're going to take like you agree, if you want to be unbiased, take both sides. So Israel doesn't have a number for civilian casualties because there is no way to determine in the actual so as a matter of fact, the United Nations and Hamas says there's 10 to 11,000 on our 38,000 list that we don't know where they are. They're right. They haven't been able to, they haven't been able to issue death certificates for those bodies. That isn't that they don't have the bodies or they the body parts. The body. They do have the they bodies. They've the said, body. well, they have the parts, you know, they just don't have the I ability. Actually heard you say this. Um, I actually heard you say this and it's not true. You go to the United Nations tracking system um, and at the very bottom in an asterisk, it says 10,000 unaccounted for people believe to be under body that that's a name that a family member has provided is I don't know where this person is. It's not a body part. It isn't DNA. It's actually missing people. You can actually go onto a website mm -hmm. and log your martyr here. And, and that will go on the list. And the United Nations trying to be, although it's not often unpartial says we, we agree there's 10,000 on this list that are unaccounted for. Not Do a you body think that it's found. reasonable to believe with the type of warfare that's gone on in Israel, that 10,000 people are buried under the rubble and cannot be dug out. Do you think that's a reasonable? No, I, um, possibly. This is why right. if we take the numbers, right? So let's mm -hmm. say 38,000. Let's say it was. Although if you take the 38,000, you don't get to 50,000 or 50% men and women or women and children, because even Hamas, who does the designation, if people do the time to go by name, by designation, it's not 50% women and children. It's just not. Matter of fact, where children is identified as 18. I joined the military at 17. So again, these are there's three types of lies in the world, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Have there been a lot of civilians harmed and killed in Gaza? Absolutely. How does that compare to anything that's come before historically low? Why do you say that? It's one and a half percent of the, of the Palestinian population. If you go by that number, which I understand is a disputed number, but if you go by that number, that's 1.5%. When we look at the previous uh, battles, for example, the entirety of the Iraq war, uh, okay. that was, I mean, that's, let's see what the entirety of the Iraq war. 400,000 civilians, 300 to 400,000 civilians killed during the Iraq war. Yeah, well, my number is 210,000 to 460,000. Uh, so that, right. so it's right in that. Um, that would be given the population of approximately 26 million in 2003, the higher estimate is about 2% of the population died. So that is, that's, you know, right now we're at 1.5% of the Palestinian population. And they're saying at the high end, the population death in Iraq was 2% of the population. But that was from 2003 to 2011. That wasn't for just a, a, a few months. I mean, we're not even a year into this and they've already killed 1.5% of the population. Okay. Um, that, that's, a, that's a, again, I mean, that's a real problem. problem. This gets to the problem of aggregating, disaggregating data. Um, if I can show you individual battles, like we did with the Battle of Mosul, I can do it for the Second Battle of Fallujah. I can do it for the Battle of Manila. Um, you want to stay out of, of World War II? Let's do the Battle of yeah. Okay, let's do the Battle of Seoul in, in the Korean War, which well, is actually still, still going on. Yeah, but, well, you're right, technically, but it's still the the issue though is still like the smart technology versus the technology we were using back then. You know, we, right, we is, have well, a much you won't better. See to me that, doesn't matter. Like this is if, if complete cities are destroyed just with advanced technology, it is the actual defending and the, the, the aspect of what is the terrain? Why do I have job security is because urban warfare is the place where anybody wants to pull a stronger, bigger military. And 
achieve their goals into that urban terrain. Yeah, thought, if they were in the open. I, John, we, I thought you didn't benefit from war. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Here. I, I you know, have job security or, or what? What is this? Um, no, I. It just I, keeps going. Okay. Nobody studies it. So this is where you are trying to aggregate numbers of a war, 1% of the population. You don't want to use Russia, okay, 10% of the Chechen population in a matter of months or, because, again, they don't follow the laws of war. Well, I mean, you know, okay, this, if you're going to go with an old battle, then go to World War One. How many civilians were killed in World War One? Very few. Why is that? Because they didn't fight the war. Very few civilians killed in World War One. Yeah, there was because they were fighting on the they weren't in the cities, were they? I mean, that's from my understanding, they weren't in the cities in World War One. Uh, World you, you War II, yeah. Something called the Battle of Verdun. Um, there, Overall, there were comparatively, a lot of uh, a lot of civilians uh, were killed in World War One. Per, the absolutely. percentage, the the combatant to civilian ratio, I think, is very low for World War One. Not World okay. War Two. Well, let me address that as a. Again, but even then, I mean, that's such an old war, I mean, and they didn't war has have come before today. <laughs> Nobody's ever asked in any war that's ever come before Israel's war, which has to look at intent of. Nobody's ever asked in any war before Israel's war in Gaza, what is your civilian to combatant ratio? I can tell you that as a as a as a student of war. They must, I mean, what, what are the Geneva Conventions? The whole point of the Geneva Conventions are to say you have to protect civilian life. Well, how do you measure that? So you have to have some sort of measurement. One of the measurements is the civilian oh, to combat. Okay, so you don't think it's the civilian to combatant ratio, but it certainly is oh. the proportionality. That is absolutely in the G Geneva Conventions. Proportionality is there. The uh, proportionality it's of, it is, it's actually, it's, it's literally. It's a fundamental principle of the law of war that was there long before the Geneva Conventions. The principles Geneva of Convention distinction. Two things. It protected prisoners of war and it protected it it, it re it put stronger protections on the civilians. And the number one intent of the Geneva Conventions is what you what militaries can and can't do, like carpet bombing civilians for the purpose of the civilians to be punished. Okay. You cannot say there's no evidence to say that Israel is trying to target civilians in Gaza. Period. It's Okay, so that's a rhetoric that thing, right? So then, so then, no, all you have act. to do, so all you have to do in a command center is you, all you have to do is say, well, in order to skirt this law, you know, in order to get around this, we just can't bomb this hospital, be, or we can't target this hospital, or we can't target this school uh, because of the civilians. We have to say, well, there's tunnels underneath the school where Hamas fighters are hiding. So as long as you can use that, I mean, Russia does the same thing, right? Russia would say, well, we weren't really targeting those civilians. They, they absolutely say this. The Russians never say we targeted civilians. That is something maybe others then say when they look at what Russia's doing. But Russia never says that. They say, well, no, we weren't. We had this X, Y, Z excuse. So, I mean, that's why I'm saying we can't put the, um, we have to just look at the actual facts in order to then deduce like what is actually happening. Because once you start getting into this rhetoric game, then anybody could spin anything for, you know, you can go on a murdering spree and say it was all on self-defense. It was all in self-defense. And that is what Israel is doing, doing. And that is what also Russia is doing. Uh, no. So like when Russia ties civilians hands behind their back and shoot them in the back of the head in Bucha, over a hundred of them, that's different than what you just portrayed as their actions in Ukraine. And I can give you lots of examples of that. So there, there's lots of differences, but what you just did as a holistic aspect of interpreting the laws of war, Geneva conventions, protocols, all of this stuff is the number one thing that people do make a mistake is do effects based assessment as mm -hmm. in, the law of war is prescriptive on like necessity and proportionality. And, and that requires what you know at the moment you're doing the operation, what is the expected collateral damage and what have you done to prevent it? On what everybody's turned that around and said, well, look, look how many civilians have died. Clearly they're trying to kill civilians. Look how much destruction has been done. Clearly the one, that's not the way the law of war works. It's not effects based. It's intent and actions that you took with the information you had at the moment. So to say that Israel is targeting any school or hospital they want with just saying, well, there's a tunnel under it, it's not true because you're required to take all feasible steps, is what the wording says, to get civilians out of harm's way. Like waiting, and you you acknowledge that Israel evacuated hundreds of thousands, over 850,000 in the beginning of the war out right. of northern Gaza. Russia didn't do that. It didn't evacuate one single location before invading Ukraine. It's a, a bigger conversation. Every step that Israel has done to include with schools and hospitals, the, the calling the location beforehand that which we other militaries don't do. 
You can't say that Israel is not following the law of war or targeting civilians when everything they're doing is actually all evidence, not rhetoric. All evidence shows that they're doing the complete opposite of that and moving civilians out of harm's way. One time. I mean, they moved the civilians out of the way in the north. One thing that— and in the south. Well, I mean, where did where could they go? So in just looking Let's at it objectively— yeah, right. Objectively, where can the Palestinian people go? So when you look, when you compare this urban warfare with the other previous urban warfares that you study and that you are an expert on, the what percentage of the infrastructure has been demolished to where, you know, if you're looking at any other conflict that we've engaged in, I think probably a better, you know, within this within the scope of the war on terror. So from 2000 let's say, okay. to now, so not going back further into Vietnam or World War II or whatever, or Korea, but sticking with the war on terror in the, in the Middle East. What, you know, when when people have been evacuated or when they've escaped or they've left, I mean, what percentage of the infrastructure was destroyed to where, you know, at this point, they're telling the Palestinian people, okay, first they say, go south. And then they say, all right, now you got to move north, or you got to move west, or you got to move east, or you got to, you know, they're constantly shoving these people around without really giving them... You know, I mean, at some point, if you have nowhere to go, I mean, what do you do? They tell you to leave. And, and at some point, you just have to say, I just I have to stay here and risk it. I don't have anywhere else to go. And it, it's so it's one thing to say we've evacuated all these people. But you could say that. And it's just that's just uh, lip service when you're not giving these people a viable place to actually go and be actually safe and with enough time. And using enough measures. Now, Israel says, well, we, we uh, call people. We do roof knocking. Well, who cares? Uh, calling people, how much of the telecommunication system is actually operational there? How many of the people actually got those calls? Uh, roof knocking. We're talking about tall buildings. Do the people on the bottom floors hear those roof knocks? You know, I mean, there's all of these questions about the things that they claim that they're doing. Did they give them enough time? Did they give them enough place? It just doesn't really look like they've really set up a true method, especially when they're destroying a lot of the place. You know, oh, well, then it turned out Hamas found out that we were evacuating people this way and they started blocking places. So we blew up the route. I mean, that's what we're kind of hearing. So what is what is what can the Palestinian people do? Where can okay. they go? Um, there's a lot there. Um, so I will agree with you. One, I can if you want to compare any war that's happened since 2001. Yeah. Um, wars in which the def the enemy defended the terrain or prepared to defend the terrain for or defense. Why is a small city in Iraq, the city of Fallujah, a city of 300,000, the largest urban battle that the U.S. military fights for the entire Iraq war, bigger than the, the city of Baghdad, over 5 million, and we, in, and we had the battle of Baghdad? Why is this small city, which we evacuated, and or there were only 3,000 to 1,000 defenders in that city, because when the defender prepares an urban area, for defense, it becomes very destructive. So the numbers, your first part of your question, 80 to 90%. Look at the Battle of Mosul, 80% of Western Mosul. The Battle of Fallujah, most structures damaged or destroyed. Look at the Battle of Marwari in the Philippines, which people forget about in 2016 against 1,000 ISIS fighters, completely made and inhabitable for five years. On where do the Palestinian people go, right? One is, it is, it is a fact that the Palestinian people did evacuate many of both in the north to include in rafa where you have like 90 to 100 percent evacuation where do they go i agree with you where you have a lot of uniqueness in this situation where the palestinian people are trapped inside of the gaza strip because egypt would not let a single refugee out of gaza to establish a you know a, a displaced persons camp in the sinai or anything like that so there's some uniqueness but just to say that they said go south is not true Israel identified the Al Mawasi zone, right? The it's on the southwestern portion of Gaza, where the only place where they could determine ISIS had not prepared the ground because it's sandy beach area, prepared the ground for defense, as in tunnels and infrastructure, everything. That's where they were mostly told to go. Although you discount the fact that during the one ceasefire, which I disagree, which which is only done through. Um, political negotiation. It was done through the use of political and military. That during that ceasefire, of the Palestinian civilians who had successfully moved into the Al Mawasi humanitarian zone, Hamas forced into Khan Yunus and, and increased the population of an area Israel had not gone yet to 300% of what it was before the war. But to say that Israel, you know, they have nowhere to go, while you also say, not you, but 
while we also right. know that 850,000 of the 1 million residents of northern Gaza successfully evacuated before the ground invasion right. started. You know that over a million people were moved within days of southern Rafah and moved into the Al Mawasi zone, which they did expand, giving places more to go because Israel is fighting a war in battles that nobody else has had to. Talk uh, Ukraine, where millions of people left Ukraine and escaped by car, by foot, by train while Russia attacked, not that Russia gave people time to evacuate, but in all these other battles, you're right. And even in Fallujah, we evacuated 80 to 90% of the civilians, although the civilian to combatant ratio is still higher than, than Gaza, but they had somewhere to go as in they could escape the major combat area, but you're blaming Israel for that when it's, how about we blame Hamas and how about we blame Egypt? Why would we blame Egypt? Where did the, where did the Iraqis go? Where did those, where did they go when they were evacuated? Was it still in Iraq? Some, no, some, some, if they had family members in other countries, you can't say that they just went there, right? No, I mean, um, no. there there might be people that escaped on their own, that left on their own, right? And they, they went yes. somewhere else in the world, but where were they militarily the evacuated to? Yeah, where were they, where were the people militarily evacuated to? Also yeah. in Iraq, um, inside in, of Iraq. In, well, let's, let's look at the, there's only two battles that we can really look at that where somebody actually made the effort to evacuate the civilians and move them somewhere. In the Battle of Mosul, 2016-17, the Iraqi government, because again, that was their war against ISIS and we helped with air power, they mm -hmm. told 850,000 people to stay in the city during the battle and it caused civilian death. Eventually, they told them to be moved. But yes, if you're trying to say that they had a very safe place outside of the combat area to go, you'd be right. Like there, Iraq's a huge country. There were areas where NGOs and the United States and others could set up tent the displaced personnel camp, right. although they many of them weren't um, properly uh, resourced and then people just went to the camp and just kept on going somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Israel, this is the problem of what did you think, what is the realm of possible what you thought Israel could do in all of these criticisms on the destruction, on the protection of civilians, on the creating of a humanitarian safer zone. When Hamas actually, you said about attacking the zones yeah. and it has been the evidence shows that Hamas is the one attacking civilians on these routes or launching rockets from within. I mean, they hid their number two guy, the number two guy of Hamas who was killed last week, uh, the highest commander, you think of like a four-star general, was in the humanitarian zone on purpose to use the civilians of Palestine as protection from being targeted. Hey guys, this was just a clip of a longer show. Catch the full show by going to KimIversonShow.com. It is free. It airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. You could go back now and watch this full interview. I highly recommend it. Again, go to KimIversonShow.com. Thank you so much for watching.